Picture this, a seemingly ordinary pig farm nestled in the rural outskirts of Port Coquitlam, Canada, where the green fields mask a sinister secret. Hidden beneath the facade of family farm life, Robert Picton, a quiet farmer, became one of the most notorious serial killers in Canadian history. Robert William Picton was born on October 24, 1949, in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, 17 miles east of Vancouver. When he was born, his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. This may have caused him some sort of brain damage caused by a lack of oxygen. Picton was the middle child in a family of pig farmers. His older sister, Linda Louise Wright, was sent away to live with relatives since her parents thought the pig farm was no place to raise a young girl. Robert and his younger brother, David Francis Picton, started working on the pig farm at a young age alongside their demanding mother, who prioritized the pigs over the personal care of her two sons. She often sent them to school in their dirty work clothes, which led to their classmates dubbing them Stinky Piggy. Picton's father was abusive and his sons tried to evade him as much as possible. At school, Picton struggled a lot, and he was placed in a special class after failing the second grade. In 1963, 14-year-old Picton dropped out of school and began a career as a meat cutter, which he pursued for nearly seven years before returning to the family farm. In 1978, Picton's father died, and a year later, in 1979, his mother followed him to the grave. Picton, then in his late twenties, inherited the farm and large pieces of land together with his brother and sister. The farm itself had an eerie ambiance, with a massive 600-pound boar patrolling the grounds. Picton was by then described by his neighbors as slow but not retarded, and although he was a quiet man, he and his siblings often threw wild parties at a converted building near the pig farm called the Piggy Palace. Among the people who attended the parties were bikers and sex workers from the Vancouver downtown east side. Downtown east side is Canada's poorest postal code. These blocks are often called the low track or skid row and hold Canada's highest rates of prostitution, poverty, and drug use. Picton was familiar with the downtown east side since he regularly disposed of pig parts at the local rendering plant there. When he drove around low track, he would often offer women money or drugs and take them back to his farm. In 1995, 46-year-old Picton and his siblings sold portions of their land for a staggering total of 5.16 million Canadian dollars. It was around this time that women began to go missing in alarming numbers. Since the early 1980s up until 2001, more than 65 women had gone missing in the downtown east side, most of them sex workers and drug addicts. The disappearances in the area raised concerns and activists, families, and community members had been pressuring law enforcement to take action for years. By the late 1990s, the Vancouver Police Department finally began to suspect that a serial killer might be active in the downtown east side. However, the investigation took years, and there were several missed opportunities to catch the person responsible for the disappearances. On March 23, 1997, a motorist found a wounded woman beside the highway at 1.45 a.m. The woman, named Wendy Lynn Eistetter, who was a prostitute from downtown Eastside, later told police that Picton had attacked and handcuffed her. She managed to escape after disarming Picton and stabbing him with his own knife. Although Picton was arrested and charged with attempted murder, he was released on a $2,000 bond. The charge was dismissed without explanation in January 1998. Late in 1998, the police got their best lead yet. 37-year-old Bill Hiscox, a worker on the Picton pig farm, had grown concerned about Picton after reading multiple news articles about Vancouver's missing women. The incident with Eistetter had raised his suspicion and he told the police about Picton's regular trips to the downtown east side to pick up sex workers. 
He also told the police about the many women's purses and IDs that were lying around in Picton's trailer. Police recorded Hiscox's statement and visited the pig farm, apparently without result. Meanwhile, back in Vancouver, the list of missing women only grew longer with no end in sight. More than three years later, on February 6, 2002, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police executed a search warrant for illegal firearms at the Picton property. Picton, as well as his younger brother David, were arrested. During the search, personal items such as women's clothing, shoes, jewelry, and a prescription asthma inhaler belonging to a missing woman were found at the farm. Because of the many items found, police obtained a second warrant to search the entire farm as part of the BC missing women investigation and the farm was sealed off. As police searched the grounds of the pig farm, they found multiple human remains, such as a skull cut in half and a freezer stuffed with human hands and feet, DNA from 33 different women, bloody clothing, a jawbone and teeth. They also found a 22 revolver with a dildo attached to its barrel, 27 magnum rounds, two pairs of faux fur-lined handcuffs, a pair of night vision goggles, a garbage can containing human remains, and a blood-stained wood chipper. On February 22, 2002, Picton was charged with two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Serena Abatsway and Mona Wilson. On April 2, 2002, three more charges were added for the murders of Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, and Heather Bottomley. A week later, a sixth and seventh charge for the murder of Andrea Josbury and Brenda Wolfe followed. Before the end of the year, eight more charges were added, bringing the total to 15, making the investigation the largest of any serial killer in Canadian history. While in custody, Picton told an undercover officer posing as a fellow inmate that he had wanted to kill one more in order to bring his victim count up to an even 50, suggesting that he was responsible for 49 murders. Excavations at the farm continued through 2003, and the police took over 200,000 DNA samples from the farm. Forensic analysis was extremely challenging because not one whole body was found, but only body parts and particles. It became known that Picton had fed parts of his victims to his pigs on the farm, and he might have ground up human flesh with pork meat that was handed out to friends and visitors to the farm. Forensic anthropologists brought in heavy machinery, including two 50-foot flat conveyor belts and soil sifters, which were used to sift through 383,000 cubic yards of soil and dirt to find traces of remains. The cost of the investigation was estimated to be $70 million. By the end of the investigation, 12 more charges had been laid against Picton, bringing the total number of first-degree murder charges to 27. Picton's trial began on January 30, 2006, in New Westminster, and would become one of Canada's most high-profile and emotionally charged cases. The defense attempted to portray Picton as mentally unstable, but the prosecution meticulously built a case against him. Picton pleaded not guilty to the 27 charges of first-degree murder in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Later on, Judge Justice James Williams severed the charges by splitting them into two groups. One group of six counts of first-degree murder and another group of 20 counts of first-degree murder. The trial proceeded on the group of six counts on January 22, 2007. By the end of the year, Picton was found guilty by a jury on six counts of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. Since life in prison is Canada's maximum sentence, the prosecution decided not to continue the trial on the other 20 murder charges. This news was received with mixed emotions by the families of the victims. Some were disappointed that Picton would never face charges for the deaths of their beloved ones, while others were relieved that the gruesome details of the murders would not be aired in court. Today, Robert Picton is incarcerated at the Federal Reception Center in British Columbia, Canada. His younger brother, David Picton, was never charged and is still at large. Until now, it is unknown if he was aware of the gruesome acts of his brother. As we conclude this narrative, it's essential to remember that the story doesn't end with Picton's conviction. 
The legacy of his crimes lives on in the hearts of survivors and the families who mourn their lost daughters, sisters, and friends. Share your thoughts on Picton's crimes in the comment section below. If this story caught your interest, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more stories about serial killers worldwide. Until next time, and stay safe.